Children's Church right now. Go ahead and do that. Um, it's interesting. How many of you remember your first job that you ever had? Does anybody remember your, first, your very first job? Uh, I was actually, some of you may not realize this, but 27 years, I'm not going back for a ladder, by the way, for those of you who heard me preach before. I'm not going for a ladder, all right? Um, about 27 years ago, I was in line to come to the Naval Academy to be an officer. However, because of my eyesight, I wasn't let in. And so, I wound up going to Southwest Texas State University, and uh, God called me into ministry, and found Donna there, and I'm still in Annapolis, so I think everything worked out okay. But the, and Kermit, I do apologize, you told me you wanted me to keep my jacket on today, but it's not going to happen for a little while anyway. The only time I've ever had the opportunity to fulfill my naval ambitions was when I was a glass bottom boat driver <laughs> at Ocarina Springs in San Marcos, Texas. Now if you've ever been to Florida and you know about this, it's the same sort of thing. You have a big boat, it's powered by a, a ton of electric batteries, you have a little speaker here that's all metal so every time you touch it it zaps you. And you have a, a big glass well right here. And you go around and you show people the fish, the springs, the fish, the springs for 30 minutes. And then they come back and everybody's happy. Now, this particular craft was operated in this manner. You had a steering wheel right here. It had a big piece of electrical tape type on one part of it. And that was attached to the, to the motor housing, which was attached to a shaft, which was attached to the propeller. All right, And so the propeller was always pointing opposite of the little piece of tape so you knew which direction you were going in. If you were going forward, you aimed it forward and the propeller was shooting you backwards. And then to slow down, you turn it around this way and of course the propeller would turn and slow your momentum and then you would do the hover maneuver which was this and you're just going and, and, it, and you hover over the springs and ooh, look, a catfish. And you get questions like, is it wet down there? And <laughs> Are there sharks and things like that? So I had been at this job for one week, my very first job. I, was, I, was, I just graduated from high school. And I went out on the boat. And what you did was you went to one end of the lake and kind of looked at some catfish and springs. And then you went to the other end of the lake where it was a deep hole. And the dam was further down that way. And there was a, a, a other sorts of items that way. So I get in the boat. Welcome to Aquarius Springs. I'm, I will be your glass bottom boat driver for the next 30 minutes. Happy to have you here and go through my little spiel. But as I'm going along, I notice that the wheel is not doing what it's supposed to do. It's catching a little bit. I mean, I'm still getting around okay and I'm maneuvering the boat all right. But I, and I get about halfway through the tour and things are going well and I get over deep hole. And so I swing it around to, to stop, to turn the propeller. And I swing it around and we're still going forward. And they're all looking down, and there goes Deep Hole. And I look up, and there's the gift shop. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm desperately turning this thing, and it's finally starting to catch just a little bit. And, and by this time, they're looking down at just weeds, and they can't figure out what, well, what, what part of this is, what part of the tour is this. And I finally get it turned, all right? So we're turned away from, we're steered away. And you, now, those of you who own a boat know, well, why don't you just cut the motor off? Well. There's not enough friction to stop the momentum of that thing. It's going to keep going. Now I'm heading for the fountains that are coming up out. And so I'm slewing this thing around and, and I, I come up against the bank and there's all these big elephant ear plants, a giant, all come through the window. And there's, so I look at my people and they look at me and I go, this is an elephant ear. And... <laughs> And, and, and we're close enough to the fountains where water is, is sprinkling into the front of the boat, you know. You, and so um, I'm sitting there wondering what to do. And one of my buddies, after he picks himself off the ground laughing, comes around and digs his way through the elephant ear, sticks his head in and says, you, you need some help? I said, yes. So I said, okay. So he goes around and, and um, I'm looking out the window and I see another glass bottom boat coming over. So I get out of the boat and I, I jump on the glass. Well, that freaks everybody out. The glass is not going to break, but they don't know that. So I walk across, and I'm standing 
on the part where you walk into the boat. You know, you walk in and you sit on either side of this thing. And I look over, and there's my boss, and his boss, and his boss. <laughs> They're all on this boat coming around the corner, and I'm, I'm like, okay, it, the end is over. And, and, and water's kind of sprinkling down on my head and, and coming down like this from the fountain. And, and they say, what's wrong? And I tell them what happened. What happened was, in this whole assembly here, there is a little set screw, okay? And it's, a, it's a hex screw for which you need an Allen wrench to tighten it back up. And so they knew what had happened was it had just come loose. And all I had to do was get an Allen wrench and tighten it back up and things would be fine. So I'm standing here with water coming down and they, they lean out and they, do you have an Allen wrench on the boat? What? Do you have an Allen wrench on the boat? Is there an Allen wrench on this boat? The foreman almost fell in the water. He was laughing so hard. And so they, they, they went ahead and tied me up and, and uh, we, we went back around and, and I, was, I was forever in the folklore of Ocarina Springs until it was bought by Southwest and turned into a Southwest Texas state and turned into a aquatic reserve. I was Alan Wrench. I mean, I went back several years later. Did you ever hear the story? Oh, Alan Wrench. Yeah, we, they tell us that story all the time. So, um, isn't it nice to be able to do a children's sermon with the adults? Um, <clears throat> have you ever felt like that? Like I felt where you're just turning this wheel, trying to get it going in the right direction, and it's not working? And you're just plowing ahead toward, you know, whatever. And you can't get it on track. And the problem is, at the very center of this, things weren't set. Jesus gives us a verse that helps us with this. And it's found in Luke 9.23, and it goes like this. If anyone would come after me... He needs to do three things. Deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So our, our journey this morning is going to be to look at how that sort of thing plays out in our lives. Okay, now I'll put my jacket back on. Um, and I think the best way to do a comment on Scripture at this point is we're going we're gonna to work our way through another passage of Scripture. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Luke 12. And we're going to start out in verse 13. Now Jesus has been teaching, and He's been doing some warnings and encouragements to people. And uh, somebody in the crowd jumps up and says, Teacher! Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Boy, brothers had a hard time with inheritance back then. You notice that? I mean, the, the, the song that, that Ron sang. And, you know, it really wasn't that hard. Society said, this is how you do your inheritance. It was not like here where we write up our own will and divvy up money however we want to. Pretty much the societal norm was the older son got twice as much as the other one. All right? So Jesus sees through this and, and sees this guy has a problem that goes beyond inheritance. And he says, man, who appointed me as a judge and an arbiter between you? And then he said, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. And then he starts working through in the next few verses what we're going to do, some, some areas that are going to tie back in to what we talked about early, earlier. Now, Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, you've got to deny yourself. That word deny is the same word that is used to describe what Peter did when he denied Jesus. It's the same word. And it carries with it the idea of renouncing, of turning aside, of turning your back on. So, 
how does that work in our own lives? How do we deny ourselves? How do we do this sort of thing? And um, so Jesus takes up this parable of the rich fool. And Henry preached on this not too long ago, so, uh, so I, I, if I repeat anything he said, it's, it's not on purpose. But he said that uh, there was a, a rich, a, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. Now, already Jesus is setting something up there, isn't he? Did he say the rich man produced the crop? No, he said the ground of the rich man produced the crop. And so this guy's got all this extra crop. Things are coming in. Things are looking good. And he says, what am I going to do with all this abundance? What am I going to do with all this abundance? I know, self. The guy talks to himself. It's really great in in the King James because he says to himself, self, I'm going to build me a bigger barn. And put more, and store it away, and stow it away so I can take my ease. And then God says, thou fool, this very night, your life is going to be required of you. And all this stuff that you've you've accumulated, all these toys that you've gathered up around you, are going to be divided up among other people. (sighs) Greed has a really strong hold on our hearts in our society. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, it has a hammerlock on us. All you've got to do is turn on the TV for longer than like five minutes. Right? The commercials, everything. You don't have enough, do you? You really don't. You don't have enough. You need more. Why do I need more? Because you need more. Well, why do I need more? Because you need more. And we get on this this cycle of whoever gets the most toys at the end wins. And Jesus is saying, if you're going to be the kind of person that's going to follow after me, you need to set that attitude aside. Now, let me ask you a question. You don't want to see that. That's my ATM card. Um, Is this evil... Is it? Is this an evil thing? Is it a good thing? It's just a thing. And, you know, I have no idea how many hands this dollar has passed through or what sort of things this dollar has been used to do. But I can decide for myself how I want this to be spent. Am I going to spend it on my own pleasure? Am I going to spend spend it to provide for my family? Am I going to spend it to advance the gospel? I have a choice, but it's my choice. And what God is saying to us is we have to decide in denying ourselves, we need to renounce any kind of idea that we're in charge. That's the key. We're not in charge. He's in charge. Now he's going to develop this idea a little further along. The next thing he says is what? Um, in, in chapter 12, he, he then leaps into the, the do not worry passage. Now, I've got to tell you something. When Jesus talks about don't worry, and this is the passage that has the, the birds of the air and the lilies in the field, okay? But this is in a different context from the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, he's not preaching the Sermon on the Mount at this point. This is in a different setting. So, you know, I don't know, to me, if Jesus repeats something twice in two separate occasions, then maybe he's trying to get a point across to me. And he says, don't worry. Does anybody know what the word, where we get the English word worry from? If you have a terrier, anybody here own a terrier dog? Any kind of, you know, but no terrier, there's a terrier owner back there. Terriers were bred to hunt small animals like badgers and skunks and foxes and rats, particularly rats. They were bred to, and do you know how a terrier kills a rat? It grabs it by the throat and squeezes until it can't breathe. 
And do you know what the word is that's used to describe that action? Worrying. You ever feel like this? Dads, you ever feel like this? You're trying to take care of your family and that bill comes in that you weren't expecting and you feel... <laughs> yeah. So how can God tell us don't worry when we're, you know, we, we live in a worry-filled world. I mean, we've, we've got terrorist alerts going on all the time and and, and yeah, it, was, it was funny, uh, we were driving home from somewhere, and you know the big signs they have up now that have the, you know, and it got confusing because they had Amber Alert, and they gave a, and people were like, Amber, is that in orange or yellow or what? You know, the people got confused about that. But I noticed one the other day, and it said, heightened alert, report any suspicious terrorist activity. Uh, now, I think what they meant to say was report suspicious and or terrorist activity because to me, terrorist activity would just be suspicious by its very nature, wouldn't you think? You know, run-of-the-mill terrorist activity, don't worry about. Um, <laughs> if it's suspicious but it doesn't involve terrorism, don't worry about, you know, that sort of thing. And I, I think one of the reasons why we, we our society is so worried about stuff is we don't know what to do with these alerts. Do we? I don't. What do you do when, it, when the threat level raises to orange? Go buy more duct tape and grab some, you know, what? And so you've got this, this, this unease, this, you know, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Well, well, Jesus tells us what to do. He says, rely on me. Trust in me. Don't be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief can come near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. What do you treasure? What do you treasure? Not what you own, not what you possess, but what do you treasure? My father was a um, steely-eyed fighter pilot. Flew in World War II, flew in um, Vietnam, and uh, my mother was a steely-eyed logistics officer. She was also in the Air Force. That's how they met. They both met and married um, in the mid-50s uh, in Newfoundland. And my mother, in fact, was a crack shot. She, was, she carried a sidearm because she was guarding logistical supplies. And she was a better shot than my dad, but I'm not going to go into that. But um, when my father commanded fighter squadrons, he would uh, do several things that would help his men perform better. And he wasn't just worried about how they were able to fly the airplane. He gave them a book on parenting and said, you will read this book and you will give me a report. Because he knew if, if they weren't taking care of their families, if they were worried about how they were going to deal with their families, they weren't going to be a good fighter pilot. You know, Gregory Peck passed away this week. And um, if you don't, if you've never seen To Kill a Mockingbird, you need to rent that and watch it. If um, the story is compelling, but to watch the character of Atticus Finch, how he fathers his little girl's scout, is something that I think that we could all benefit from. But there was another movie that Gregory Peck made in 1949 called 12 O'Clock High. Anybody remember seeing that movie? It was about how you deal with leadership in a military setting. And the setting was World War II and bomber pilots getting knocked out of the sky. And Gregory Peck was this gung-ho, hard um, officer who came in to whip this squadron into shape. 
And uh, by the end, he's spending time worrying about if his boys are going to make it back or not. And it's a strong study in leadership, but it also carries with it the idea that what we're to do as leaders is to train people and then trust them. I'm going to go into that a little bit more in a couple of minutes, but I want you to hold on to that idea of training and trusting and how that deals with how we relate to each other in the area of worry. Okay. Now the last thing Jesus says to us in Luke 9.23 is follow... Oh, you know what? I'm, I got so excited I forgot about what I was going to say. The second section of that verse, Luke 9.23, sorry about that. Take up your cross daily. Now what do we think about when we think about taking up your cross? Oh, I've got this burden for Jesus that I'm carrying. You know? And uh, we're being very noble and heroic. Now, had Jesus been crucified yet when he, was, um, when he made this comment to his disciples? It's an easy question. No. Because <laughs> he's talking to them. Okay? He hadn't been crucified yet. He hadn't been crucified and he hadn't been resurrected. So they don't have any idea about that. All they know is what crucifixion was for. It was for killing you. And for someone to take up their cross, for someone to pick up a cross meant I'm going to die today. And in the other passages that are quoted where Jesus says this uh, verse, he, the, the word daily is not used, but Jesus was making a point here. That's a day by day by day by day process that we have to make of dying to ourselves. And, and dead people don't worry. <laughs> they can't. They're dead. You know, it, It's a conscious decision that you have to make day by day by day. And if, um, if you don't do that, you know, uh, Paul, or actually the writer of Hebrews, talks about in, in Hebrews, um, your life is a living sacrifice. Remember that passage in uh, Hebrews 12? Well, you know what's the problem with living sacrifices are, don't you? They tend to crawl off the altar. Right? You know, a, a living sacrifice is going to try to get off that altar. And so you have to decide daily, 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 I am going to live this day for Jesus. Because ultimately this is the only day you have, isn't it? What can you do about tomorrow? Nothing except seek forgiveness. What can you do about tomorrow? I mean yesterday, I'm sorry. What can you do about tomorrow? Nothing but shape it by what you do today. So as you have that attitude of I'm dying to myself, I am not allowing the world to control me, but I am going to be controlled by Jesus the worry part begins to be dealt with. Now, will we still worry? Sure we will, because we're human beings. But God is providing us a way to work through that. Now, the last thing he has on here is follow me. And I, I'm going to ask Greg Kuhlbeck to come up if he's able to. You can bring uh, Matthew up if you want to. Greg is going to help me illustrate something. All right. I have decided in the... You know, in learning, hi Matthew, and learning more, look at that smile, and learning more and more about being a father, I want to follow Greg Kulbeck because he's got lots of experience in being a dad, right? <laughs> and he does a fantastic, fantastic job of that. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, you do. Now, so I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow Greg, all right? So I'm going to follow Greg. I'm following Greg. Am I following Greg? No. Where's Greg? He's over there. Now, now if, if um, okay, let's try that again. This time I want you. I don't want you to walk that way toward the organ, okay? Now I'm going to follow Greg. Greg. 
Am I following Greg? No. Okay, come on, back over, Greg. All right. There's two things that have to happen when you're following. One, you've got to have someone who's moving that you're going to follow. That you're, that this, Greg has to take the initiative to walk and lead in order for me to follow, right? But I have to take the initiative to walk alongside him and learn from him. Okay, let's go. All right. Clear enough? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Good job. Well, I've got complete eye lock on Matthew Kulbeck right now. It's a both and sort of a thing, this whole idea of following. Um, God takes the initiative in our lives. Okay? It's not like we can make him jump through hoops for us. He takes the initiative. But he calls upon us to walk alongside him in the way. The word that's used for follow in that verse is the word we get acolyte from. Some of you may have had that if you're from another faith tradition might know what an acolyte is. So it's not just loping along behind, but it's, it's accompanying, it's learning from, it's being a part of their life. God wants you to succeed. And... Um, this idea of watchfulness. Now, you, you ask me, well, how does following and watching connect? Because following is like a walking thing, and watching is more of a passive thing. Um, it's not. You know, the, what's, what's it say here? Starting in verse uh, 35. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your hand, lamps burning like men waiting for their master return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose masters find them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. Watching is an active thing. You know, worry is really kind of a passive thing, you know. You're kind of sitting back and you're worried about stuff. But watching means you're ready, you're poised. I, I talked about my dad. When he finished his tour in Vietnam, he commanded two fighter squadrons along the, the West Coast. Uh, Hamilton Air Force Base just outside of San Francisco and, then, and McCord Air Force Base up between uh, Seattle and Tacoma. And he was in the, the 94th Fighter Interceptor Squadron and the, the 318th Fighter Interceptor Squadron. And the, the name implies what they were to do. Their job was to defend the west coast of our nation from Soviet bombers. And the way they would do that is they were to throw themselves in their F-106s at them and shoot them down. That was the point. That's what they did. And when my dad was commanding these fighter squadrons, they would occasionally go on alert. Now, there's two kinds of alert that, they, that he would go on to. He'd go on a five-minute alert and a 15-minute alert. Now, five-minute alert meant you were in the barn. You were there at the field. Your planes were there. They were fueled up. They were ready to go. And you're sitting up there just waiting for... The, the, the time to call. And they would actually, they'd go down the, a pole like a fireman would, run over, jump in their, their airplanes, and in five minutes from the time the alert sounded to the time they were in the air, five minutes. Fifteen minute alert was not quite as on top of it like that was. On a fifteen minute alert, you could stay inside the base and go about your life, but you had to carry the brick. Now, the brick, th th see, this is pre-cell phone age, all right? The brick was a walkie-talkie on a secure channel that would call my dad and say, it's time, get over here. And when the alert came over the brick, and, and, and they called it a brick because it was about that big, and it weighed a ton. I tried to pick it up one time when I was about Jackie's age, and it was, it was hard. And w but when the, the alert came over that, he had 15 minutes from the time he got to alert to getting in the air. (sighs) 
Right now we're in the barn. And we're on essentially five minute alert. We've gathered here as a people expecting to hear a word from the Lord. Right? I mean that's why we, we, we gather together. Right? We've come here in anticipation of hearing something from God that's going to help us in our lives as we go out and live as fathers and mothers, as students, as retired people, as whatever role it is that we have in our life. And we're here and we're ready and we're listening. We're paying attention to what God has to say through us through sermons and through singing and through praying. And we're ready. Right? Where it gets harder, I think, is when we're out there. Are you on the same kind of alert out there that you are in here? I would challenge, and this is for myself as well, challenge us to live a 15 minute alert kind of life to where we're watching and we're paying attention to what God is doing around us day by day by day so that when the opportunity arises to share the gospel with someone, to help somebody in need, to be an encouragement of a brother who's down, that we're ready, that we're paying attention and that we can see how God can use us. And as He strengthens us, as He encourages us, as He brings us to Him, as we live a kind of life that He would have us to live, then not only are others going to be encouraged and strengthened, but your own life will be encouraged and strengthened as well. I talked earlier about, about training and trusting. Um, there was a survey that, that uh, George Barna did. He does a lot of Christian survey, religious surveys, that sort of thing. Um, 96% of parents of children under the age of 13 believe it is their primary responsibility to address and lead their children in their spiritual growth and development. 96%. That's just about everybody. But the rest, of the, you continue with the rest of the survey, they don't know how. And so by default, they bring their kids to church hoping that this is the place where they're going to learn that they're going to find some sort of um, relationship with Jesus. Now, that, there's two things here that I want us to, to, to think about. One, that means what we do here is very, very, very important. All the stuff you read about in the newspaper is going to pass away eventually. The only thing that's really important to God is us. And we need to be about the business of teaching and undergirding and strengthening families as they try to raise their kids in this crazy world that we're in. That means we need to be prepared here. That means if, if, uh, if God is leading you to take a leadership role, then you need to really pray about it. And the other thing it means is we need to do a better job as a people of helping our parents have some handles on how they can lead their kids. My dad, bless his heart, uh, he tried to do a family altar one time with us, and, and we were teenagers, and it was we were awful to him, you know. But he was trying. Um, but it didn't really work for us. The family altar thing didn't work for us. It worked for some families, you know. Um, gathering together and reading scripture and, and studying the word together. You need to do those kinds of things with your kids. They need to see that. They need to see that in your own life. But what, what, what my dad did was he modeled how a person lives with integrity for me. And I caught that. And that's what I, I aim for. And he pointed me in the direction, uh, not as overtly as I would have hoped, but he pointed me in the direction of Jesus, who is the ultimate person that I can look to and follow.
to find an example of integrity and strength and courage and conviction to live my life by. And as we train our kids, we have to come to the point where we trust them to live out the kind of life that we have led them toward. And I, I want to say something right now to you fathers out there as we um, conclude. You're doing a good job. You're doing a good job. I've been around your kids. You're doing good. Could you do better? Sure, we all could. But I want to encourage you that as you live the life that God's called you to live, as you look to Him for your strength and your guidance, as He guides you day by day by day, as you decide to deny yourself, as you decide to take up your cross daily, and as you decide to follow Him, He's not going to let you down. Where's your life right now? Some of you in this room may have never had your Allen wrench, your set screw set. <laughs> you don't have Jesus at the core of your being. You don't know who he is. You don't have a relationship with him. And so you're turning that wheel like crazy and your life just going in different directions. Today, you can get that right. Some of us need a little adjustment on that set screw. And um, this is a day you can do that. You can decide that today is the day, today, just for today, I'm going to follow Jesus the way he would have me to follow him and live the kind of life that he's called me to live. Some of us... <laughs> have the set screw set, but we're looking down at the fish down here in the boat, and we're not looking up occasionally to see that we're heading toward the shore or the gift shop or whatever else, you know. We need to raise our eyes, and some of us need to raise our eyes occasionally and get a, a clearer picture of what direction is it that I'm trying to go in in my life. And is the direction I've chosen the direction that God has chosen? Our instrumentalists are going to come up and Ron's going to lead us in a hymn of invitation in just a moment. And you're going to have the opportunity to do that. Now, I, I said this before and, I, and I'll continue to say it. When we get to this point in the service, all of us are going to make a decision. Everybody here is going to make a decision. Now, whether that decision involves coming forward or involves staying where you are, that's between you and the Lord. But I hope the decision that you make today is not that, okay, I'm not going to be changed today. But I hope the decision will be, because of what God has spoken to me today, I want to make a difference. And I want to make a change. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity that you give us week by week by week to gather together as your people, to enjoy the encouragement and strength that we gain from one another as your spirit moves through us. And Father, I thank you that you love us so much that you don't leave us to wallow around confused and lost and afraid, but that you reach out and you encourage us to come and to follow you. Um, Father, we take our lives and place them in your hands. In the name of Jesus. 
Amen. Our hymn of invitation is number 472. 472. Would you please stand as we sing?